Tech Reimagined. Redefining the relationship between people and technology. Brought to you by Endava. This is Tech Reimagined. Hello, you're listening to Tech Reimagined. I'm Bradley Howard and today we're focusing on reimagining the way we shop. Joining me are two guests, Thomas Beechen, the Global Tech Director of Media Digital Consumer Experiences for Mondelez International, and my colleague Jeremy Mays, VP of Strategy Acceleration at Endava. So let's get right into it. Thomas, what's the biggest shift you've seen in consumer behavior this year? Hi, Bradley. Um, for me, I think it's, it's the fact that a very large portion of the population and therefore consumers are just getting used to the digital tools by, by basic video conference, by using their mobile. So I think on one hand, it's brilliant because it really democratized the kind of the access to, uh, to that, that technology. Yet we're also starting to see how much of a divide that creates because increasingly we have the people that who can afford them and people who, who can't. So, so it's a double-edged sword, but just basic access to what were probably tools that were just for people like you and I who work a lot with technology are now absolutely everywhere. And, and my mom is better than me as FaceTime. And that's for me, that's a milestone. And Jeremy, what ways has technology changed the shopping experience from both a seller and a buyer perspective? I think maybe the answer to that question in the context of 2020, <laughs> in the context of COVID, uh, I think, you know, if you imagine COVID hitting us 10 or 20 years ago, things would have been pretty radically different, right? Some of the changes that I've seen in consumer behavior that are relevant here, I think, um, have been a fairly predictable focus and shift toward safety and security, right? Uh, I think, you know, safety, people have changed uh, the channels maybe that they shop in and ha having uh, goods delivered more often, taking advantage of things like, uh, you know, buy online, pick up at the store, that sort of thing. And I think, you know, if we talk about the types of goods they're buying, um, it, certainly at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were scaling back, you know, maybe purchases of luxury goods and entertainment and things that weren't really staples and needs um, but, uh, and, and really focusing on things that they felt that they needed to make themselves and their families feel safe. If this hit us 10 or 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had the things that have enabled those kinds of customer experiences, right? Uh, contactless payments, buy online, pick up in store. Um, so it would have been, I think, a very, very radically different um, experience. When I think about it a little bit, uh, it, there's a few examples that come to mind. Starbucks, for example, in the U.S., they made an investment decision about five years ago to enable customers to order via its mobile app. Uh, which kind of complemented their existing mobile payment capabilities. Um, and I think, you know, that's been something that's been, that certainly helped them uh, this year because uh, like most businesses, they've lost a lot of money in, in, in 2020. Um, but this ability to buy in the app and pick up and sort of contactless payments and, and, and feel safe and all that sort of thing have actually um, helped them not lose as much as they ordinarily would have. And I imagine things like that just wouldn't have been possible, you know, 10 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. You raised some good points there. So, Thomas, where does direct-to-consumer come into play? I think it, it's, we need to answer that question with the angle of what is the expected shopper experience um, rather than you know, the channel of the other technology. So we've seen some very interesting uh, times uh, during some of the lockdown periods where normal access to what is then the better shopping experience, which is... I need some chocolate, uh, I want to get them, uh, where I stopped. Uh, people just couldn't go to the shop. Uh, and I think in those type of circumstances, we've seen a spike. So people um, kind of revert or, or discovered some of those new type of, of channels because just the primary channel and, and the one that may, remained the best channel just wasn't available. So there's an element of short-term um, substitution, and that's fine. But I think there's also an element of Again, what is really the shopping experience that is being you know, chased by the consumer? And I, you know, I work for a company who does um, you know, snack, the best snack in the world. And we all kind of consume some of those. And you know, when we are on about just coming out of the park with the kids um, and just want to kind of stop and, and buy you know, a, a packet of biscuits, we kind of want the biscuits now. And we don't really want to go and say, well, I'm going to place an order and some guy in a bag is going to go and find me and pass it to me, et cetera, et cetera. So again, uh, what we see is 
some very specific activities like gifting, for instance, like personalization, where there is a real reason to actually do and execute that uh, experience online in, in a DTC place uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think this is we're going to see more and more uh, of this because the technology, the channel opens up uh, opportunities that were just not easy to do before. But I think those shopping activities that, that don't relate, that, that don't really apply, um, are, are unlikely to be um, superseded. And I think, again, direct-to-consumer can be looked into two different ways. There is these brands directly selling online, uh, and again, for those very specific shopping experiences. And then there are retailers going mobile and, and going kind of DTC themselves. Uh, and that, again, for brand and manufacturers, that's another dynamic. So we know that that's a growing part of the market. A lot of it is driven by, uh, by convenience. Um, and we know the, the consumers are, are behaving slightly differently. They've got the same intent, but they, they, um, they behave slightly differently with, obviously, there is no store. So there needs to be a replacement for the shelf and the store. And, and there, there is adaptation that we need to do. But I think the reason why people go on to um, those kind of retailer DTC are unchanged. They are still trying to do their, their weekly shop or their, their semi-weekly shop, and they have a pretty good idea of what they wanted to buy. And our job and job of our brand is make sure that we, we meet the need. And then when the, meet, the need wasn't completely obvious, then we actually um, propose a, a very interesting opportunity to buy. And for the immediate impulse purchases that you were talking about before for snacks, do you think there'll be a bigger role for some of the delivery companies to take a lead on that, that you might end up ordering a chocolate bar to be delivered to your house? They might. I look at it um, and I think that's bordering creepy. So I don't think it it, it will be. Um, but I think what I can see happening is, is a consumers, uh, consumers having a, like a primary view of, of they wanted something, so that might be they wanted the pizza, and then and then they wanted a you know a, a dessert, or so that might be they actually wanted a number of snacks because they've just remembered that they have you know four or five uh, of their uh, their children's friends coming up after school. Um, I think I think there will need to be an element of bundle um, to make to, for it to make a lot of sense. Uh, I, personally, I'm not yet sold on the let order one bar of chocolate online and let the drone land it in front of me. Um, I just don't really see where that sits in the live in the in the lives and the daily kind of experiences of consumers. There'll be some some very niche that will want that, but otherwise, I'm not completely sure. I think the challenge really is, it's like this this immediacy and then real immediacy. So so the, there's a big difference between having to go to the shop and 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 getting in the car and getting to the supermarket and coming back. And that's just you know for most people that would be like a 30 minute type of experience. And and you go okay, well then then I'm I'm not going to go and buy straight away. But when you really want the bar now, because you're on the go, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think the the kind of online piece will beat the corner shop um, anytime soon. And if it doesn't, um, then there is no reason for the consumers to get there. If it does, then it's really creepy. <laughs> so I think there's going to be a tension here. <laughs> Jeremy, what's... Yeah, so if I may, um, I, I agree with uh, everything Thomas said. I think you made some very good points, especially around the idea of um, bundling products together. Um, I think that's where the real value could potentially be realized. I think that right now you might have some DTC sort of unicorns that have impressed the market and, and, and done pretty well, but I think the competition is increasing constantly and all of the economics are really changing. I think what the companies are struggling with is um, just making the economics work. And if you're not sort of doing more than just sort of these one-off purchases for individual products, a lot of times the economics do not really work. Um, I, I think uh, I tend to be somebody who who looks into the far future um, or you know maybe midterm future to try to see try to imagine where I think ultimately things will go because I think if businesses do that if they can imagine what's the world going to be like with technology and, and you know around these issues in uh, five years, ten years, fifteen years. If at least if you have an idea that you have some level of confidence in, you can start to work towards that in small ways every single year. And uh, when I think of um, retail in general, what I see fairly far out probably is that you have uh, essentially an AI assistant that does all of your shopping for you, right? It understands your preferences. It understands your consumption patterns. It knows your inventory. It knows which products may interest you 
Um, it can time and bundle purchases and scour the internet for sales and discounts to increase your buying power. Uh, it might even be able to collaborate with others from and, and form like networks, right? Almost like Groupons or like labor unions in order to kind of harness their collective power to affect markets and pricing and things like that. Um, and I think, you know, at, at some point in the future, in our lifetimes, I, I believe, you'll have most of your needs and wants sort of taken care of for you by something like this. And I think that's going to be where things are really interesting. Because I also think on the retailer side and maybe the CPG side, there's going to be a bit of an ongoing battle in trying to, um, I don't know, outsmart that or work with that, or, you know, it's going to be a whole new set of challenges. Um, but I think that's when you'll have things like direct to consumer really kind of come into their own because at that point, like most technologies, there'll be a lot of pressure to eliminate the middleman, right? A lot of pressure to disintermediate the, the sort of equation just to, you know, can, uh, control costs and things like that. And I think that's what will be, it'll be really interesting there. The point about, you know, the assistance ordering, you know, for us, I think for me, and I agree in looking far away, that's important. The challenge that led me into two directions. One is everybody buys vanilla because then the machines are always optimizing to the lowest point con- c- denominator. So suddenly then everybody gets the same product or we just end up personalizing to the personal assistant which is kind of the same thing anyway. So to me, there is an element of of actually the choices will continue to be the same whether the decision-making process shifts a little bit. The the other piece is, and I think there, it's important to have a product consideration. Um, Ultimately, what is the product about? Uh, And if the product itself is not just in in our case, for instance, uh, a biscuit or, or a chocolate, but it also an act of affection for a mum to their children, a gift from you know, a grandchild to their grandparents. That becomes really, really difficult to let go and give that responsibility to you know, a personal assistant or, or a piece of AI. I think there will be always, you know, in the end, we are human and, and the food is consumed by human. That's one thing that is pretty, pretty good certainty for quite a, a foreseeable future. I think in, in food, we will, we will continue to have you know, human at the center of everything. They get surrounded by tech, but they're still there. Um, I think there will be other industries where that not, that's not the case. Um, I can imagine my washing machine doing some stuff on, on her own because I don't really need to get too involved in, in some, of the, some of the activities. Uh, but I think for food, uh, the humans aren't going anywhere anytime soon. I think that is an excellent point. I think you're right in that, um, obviously, food and <laughs> is a is a requirement for humans, right? But I think as such, we've evolved in a way to have this affection for everything about food um, and cooking, and it's just an experience, right? Even shopping uh, for food is an experience that I think really speaks to um, something in our brains that is quite, you know, um, you know, uh, ancient maybe. Um, and I think that there'll be a lot of ways that that won't be affected. Um, but I do think that technology will um, assist that in ways and give you the ability to sort of say where I want to be engaged and where I don't, right? Like maybe I do want to be engaged when we're talking about uh, the dinners that I cook on the weekends and things like that, because that's when I really get to exercise um, that sort of innate desire that's in in the back of your brain. But maybe, uh, I don't know, breakfast cereals or things like that, um, you know, I don't really care much about. And you know my inventory, you know my consumption patterns, just make sure that I always have a box of Cheerios in my pantry, right? Well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I think um, <laughs> I, I, I'll give you another example where the choice is made for you. So, you know, I, I, I don't watch a lot of TV, but when I do, I tend to kind of like go towards Amazon Prime and, and Netflix. The one piece that infuriates me the most is the fact that the algorithm get it wrong all the time. It just doesn't give me anything interesting. And, and, and the number of times I find myself 40 minutes on the sofa, haven't watched a single film yet because I'm trying to find a way to get to the stuff that I think is going to be cool. And, and you know, I'm, I'm French. So it should be easy for, for the algorithm to kind of say, the guy's French. Let's go find some French recent film and try to put it in front. And it, they, none, neither of them have managed to do that yet. So that's what I say. But what it does give me is the top 10 of everybody else who watched. And I'm like, I'm better than that. I want to see something that is that is better. So I think this is the, the, the machine's going to have to deal with some of that, but I'm not sure they will because 
there is hardly anything that tells us that they will be capable of you know, replicating what is a human brain and then what is a human kind of sensory system. So I'm, I'm just a little bit not as bought in in this as, um, as, as others. That's probably why I don't work in a technology company at the moment. So. <laughs> in your defense, I may be overly bought in. I'd like to read, and I'm sure we'll get into this a bit later, I like to read things like uh, books on, by Ray Kurzweil and things like that who have a very overly optimistic view of the future and artificial intelligence and all of that. So I will openly admit that that's the sort of side of the spectrum that I'm on. Thomas, back to your point or about uh, Amazon and Netflix. Um, uh, how do you think that CPG companies are helping customers to discover new products? Because as we're all finding at the moment, when you do your supermarket order or your subscription order, it's the same thing all the time. And you talked about the vanilla products before. So how do you promote new products? There's a couple of things that comes into play. Um, first of all, there's, there's the nature of the product itself for us the the obvious piece is it's always better to bring the easter egg around easter and the christmas calendar around christmas uh that helps but but that those are in effect new product at a point in time during the year so i think some of it is driven by event and, and things like that um and and i think the rest is it's a lot about on one hand uh, following how the the taste and, and the needs evolve so so the creation of the of the new products come from you know a company identifying an emerging need or a change and change in, in the need so the question is not how do you promote the question is how do you make the consumer aware but the promotion is just then an act of doing that the, the really the way i look at it is in that sense you know advertising is just news as a consumer if there is a new product you kind of need to know it exists so that you can buy it you you may want to try it so a lot of it is about awareness and, and just being in the consciousness of the consumers with the relevant messages and, 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 and advertising. And, and this is where I think shops and retail are really, really important for CPG because the, the one of the primary job of the retail is actually to showcase the product that are there for sales. When you, you know, when you imagine when you walk through the biscuit aisle at Tesco, there's just no way that you could have received an advert for every single of the SKU just there. You know, I'm, I'm, I know when I was working closely with friends, we, we have some aisle where there is 800 SKU and that was just our company. So when you get into that, that complexity, just being visible through advertising, on the shelf, through the packaging, a lot of it is that it's about attracting the, the attention. And, and then a lot of the things that, that we will do as a, you know, at Mondelez is then you, you, strike a, you strike a balance. You strike a balance of what are distinctive assets. So think of, you know, for those of you that are in the UK, Cadbury or in the US, Oreo, et cetera, et cetera. Those assets are relatively constant. And that, that help the consumer recognize that this is a product that belongs to a family of product that people would have liked before. So that's the reassuring piece of this not all new. And yet when the new product comes up, then the packaging, the shape uh, and the claim or, or whatever is the information will be then carried through a whole raft of, of medium, whether, again, it's the advertising, it might be on the website when we come in, um, or it will be, uh, you know, on the packaging uh, in the shop. So it's a, it's a really complex piece. Um, and that's what drives really all of the introduction um, that comes with, with the new product. And technology helps because technology now gives us more ways of bringing those messages to consumers at a time that is good for them, that is relevant for the product and relevant in their life. So are you helping supermarkets and retailers in general trying to make more customers aware of your new products now that many people are shopping online? Of course, and, 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 and CPG organizations have been doing that for, for decades. Um, you know, it, it's helping the retailers understand what's the best way to organize the shelves, you know, and, and would, would consumer expect to find the, you know, the chocolate biscuit next to the chocolate or next to the biscuits? That, that's not obvious. Um, and, and there's choices that need to be made. So we've been doing that for forever uh, with retailers. Um, and when retailers go mobile or, or go online, then the same principle happened, but the way this get executed is, is the therefore different um, because there's no physicality of the shelf, because there is an infinity of the shelf, and because we don't browse with the eyes, we, we, we browse with the search, uh, and that drives a completely different behavior, and then we need to be able to exploit that um, you know, the best way. I mean, I, unless you guys do that, but I've never walked into a supermarket, pick up my phone and say, find me the Cadbury's. 
um, I kind of get to the aisle and then I find them because they're all purple and it's fine. I'm, 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 I'm okay. I'm, I'm where I want it to be. Um, that's much harder to do or that's done very, very differently, um, you know, on a, on a online um, shopping solution from a retailer. Thomas, do you ever see that experience being replaced digitally somehow, the experience of walking down the aisles? And again, it, it is a very emotional sort of experience, right? Um, that is, like you said, isn't really easily replicated, at least today online. I know that a lot of companies have explored the idea of using like VR and things like that, but do you ever think that that will be, there'll be an adequate replacement from a digital perspective? Yeah. No, and I think again, it's 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 going back to the different categories. Um, you know, some of the car manufacturers are replacing the, the, the showroom visit extremely well um, digitally because you can configure your car, you can get into it through your screen, actually without having the, the car salesman just giving you the speech that, that you're hoping you won't, you won't have to listen to. So I think I've seen the car industry doing it very well. The, the airline industry is, you know, when we could travel, probably doing some decent job in kind of giving you an idea of what, you know, the, the business class or the first class would be, for instance. Um, I think L'Oreal, L'Oreal just recently just um, came out with some of their, their product around you know, just kind of like the, the, the virtual makeup for Zoom and things like that. But even even without that, if you think of the act of, and I, I apply very, very little makeup as, as Bradley would tell you, but, um, but for people who do, um, the, I think this is a private moment. And this is a moment where you want to be not with everybody. So you, the last thing you want to do is be in the shop and you want to see yourself. And, and the, the device is a perfect kind of tool to do that because it has a camera, it has a screen, and it has the ability to then actually, to some extent, make you try makeup without trying it. So, but that's because again, the the interaction of the human and the product is is then different when you do makeup, when you buy your car, when you when you kind of buy chocolate. So, I'm not saying it's not going to happen in in kind of like you know the, the snacking industry. I think there's some cases where you know we can we're on personalization, for instance, or you know the, helping people choose again the the best possible kind of gift for a relative or or, or something like that. Uh, but it really has to be looked at uh, with the angle of what's the product, what's the, what's the consumer need and what's the shopping occasion and, and environment. Thomas, you're responsible for the marketing tech solutions as well as the digital experience for customers and consumers. How are you using the data generated by these platforms to influence product and technology decisions? The way I look at it is I try to make it relatively straightforward. Um, life is becoming very digital, very connected. That connectivity is happening through technology, whether it's a mobile phone, whether it's, a, it's an email, etc., etc. And the reality is that technology cannot operate without creating data, creating um, traces. Um, and within the structure of what is legally right, what is compliant, which is ethically right, there is, there is some data that nobody should access, and there is some data that is perfectly fine to be to be used because they are um, they are an element of, of how the transaction happen. What we try to do is to say among those set of, of traces that are okay for us to use, that then how much are they uh, a bit of a proxy of actually what happened during um, a specific occasion, whether it was an order being placed, whether it was a delivery being made, whether it was somebody watching an ad. And what we try to do is, is to take some of those signals not at all use them and say, okay, Bradley, you've just seen an ad. Let me send you another email in case you didn't get the message. We try not to do that. But what we try to do is to say, okay, at scale, when we look at all of those interactions, can we use those data traces and aggregate them into performance signals and into insights? So really, for me, it's, a, it's an opportunity to get the pulse on what consumers or, or sometimes not consumers, customers and other things um, actually are and we then aggregate this and we then drive that towards yeah, product um, decisions which new product should we do advertising decisions who should we advertise what to who and then technology in the sense of um, having as little dilution of that important information uh, is the key so so finding the right platform the right product product in here it's kind of software um, so that really the hands-on are, are, are seamless in terms of the data um, that is probably the most important piece for us in terms of some of the, the kind of high level um, technology architecture that we make. I liked how you described that in the in the question as, um, as to get the pulse of consumers. That was really nice. And sorry, Jeremy. 
I was just going to say that was uh, fascinating to hear um, Thomas talk about. I, I, I think maybe this is an area where um, there is a bit of an art to it, and it's not completely a science. Um, you know, I do believe in following data. Right. We'd like to have a quick fire round where we get short answers that say a whole lot. Are you both ready for this? Let's do it. Yes, gladly. We're going to start <laughs> with guests first, and so we'll start with you, Thomas. What was your best recent shopping experience, Thomas? So I live in the UK. So this is kind of a bit UK specific. Um, and one of the big supermarkets is, is called Tesco. The kind of self-scanning piece at, at Tesco for me is, is just like near Nirvana. Um, I go in, I get my little kind of scanner, I pick what I want and then I, I get out. It's brilliant. I keep only the piece that I really like of the shopping experience and I leave out kind of the, the, the kind of the paying piece at the, you know, away from the, from the, from the journey and love it. Self-checkout and self-scanning at Tesco. And for international listeners, it's really important to say when Thomas says he skips out the paying part, he still actually pays for it. Um, and, and Jeremy? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I have the exact same answer. Um, in the US, um, the, you know, we have a pretty wide variety of different uh, grocery retailers. Uh, there's one that I use frequently in New Jersey called Stop and Shop. And uh, same exact thing. Come and scan your loyalty card, get a little uh, scanner, scan everything and bag it as you put it in your carts. And then, you know, contactless payment and all that and you're done. And to me, just the convenience of not having to do that at the end of the trip, which just seems like a big hurdle when you have a full shopping cart. Um, you have the ability to sort of see your ongoing um tally of, of what you're going to be paying and, and you know, savings and things like that uh, as you go. And, and Thomas, what's one piece of technology you couldn't live without? So I am like proper old school when it comes to, to some kind of tech. So I actually uh, went all the way back to uh, a very basic kind of analog watch uh, that I have on my wrist. And, it, and it's very interesting because my problem was I, I, I just, I need glasses now so, so people to know. So I was really struggling to see to see what was the time. So I needed some, some dives and then I needed some light. And then I wanted to do that without being connected because I, my watch is something that tells me the time, not the, for me, kind of how, how hard my heart is beating and definitely not, I don't want anybody to know about when I'm sleeping and not sleeping. So I absolutely love this watch because it does what a watch should do. It gives me the time whether I've got my glasses or not, or whether I've got lights or not. And this is just brilliant. Excellent. And Jeremy? Yeah, you know, I wish this wasn't my number one answer, but it is um, my phone. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think the reasoning for me is um, I'm old enough to remember a time where when we didn't have the world's knowledge at our fingertips 24 hours a day. I would say number two for me might come as a surprise is a, uh, a 3D printer I have, um, which, um, you know, I think as a sort of product person who works in technology a lot, it's, it's, it's good for me to flex the same kinds of uh, neurons in my brain that um, at sort of a tangible physical level when thinking of new product ideas. Um, so it's kind of a hobby, but still one I think that, uh, that I couldn't live without. Thank you. And Thomas, what's your favorite snack? Ah. Well, it is Cadbury Dairy Milk White. Uh, this is brilliant for me. It's a product that we've recently brought in the UK. Uh, again, being French, kind of white chocolate was there for in, in my childhood, and I was kind of missing that. But the combo of uh, Cadbury Dairy Milk White Chocolate is, is just the best ever. And Jeremy? Uh, this is a really difficult question for me, you know, and I, I want to say wine, but that doesn't really sound like a snack. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go with maybe, uh, uh with Oreos, uh, oddly enough. They think they're, they're amazingly delicious. They are something that are just devoured in my household, mainly by my children. I try to exercise some restraint, but, uh, I just feel like they're kind of a, a perfect little cookie. They're a only a few snacks where it's impossible to have just one, isn't there? Oreos are definitely up there. So besides your respective employers, what's the most innovative company that inspires you? So it's interesting. My immediate reaction is to kind of go towards some tech company, but actually I, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to go with, with the farmers right now. Um, I am just absolutely in awe and, and how teams out there are coming up with development times that are 
10% of what they would be before for, for you know, vaccines and, and some of, the, some of the, the, the cure that we all hope will come soon. But the ability to kind of find every single piece of time that might not have been absolutely critical before and just check it out and, and find an innovative way of doing that, I think to me that is that is absolutely mind blowing, um, and if we can do that with vaccine, that that means that some of the some of the other type of product development we'll see in the future, we'll, we'll find a way to just shave massive amount of time. Um, so pharma is for me. Oh, thank you. And Jeremy, I'm continually inspired by Apple to this day. I think that when, when I think about what they could do um, with their war chest of cash. I think that they could feel a lot of pressure to release way more products than they do. And I think the amount of restraint they generally exercise and the ability to sort of edit and keep things simple, even at the scale that they're at, is impressive to me. Um, I think that there are times where they make mistakes, but uh, I still continue to be impressed for the most part. And uh, Bradley, this might be uh, might give you a laugh, um, but I'm also a, a big Tesla fan. <laughs> um, yeah, I picked up a Mo Model 3 earlier this year, and I'm still in love with it. I think that they've rethought a lot of um, parts of the driver experience, I think, in very positive ways. And can I ask you a question on this? Sure. On on the Tesla experience. There was a, there was some news um in the UK, where people were saying one of the things which is they don't know whether it's 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 good or bad is they're getting overnight updates to the car that fundamentally change the way the car behave. Now, on one hand, it's brilliant because you don't have to go to the to the um, the dealer anymore to for the servicing and stuff like that. On the other hand, it was like bordering the unexpected change of behavior of a product that I bought earlier. What, where, where do you sit on that as a as a Tesla kind of user and owner? I think that's an excellent question. I'll tell you that I think. My experience, and I think you know, I, I've sort of become part of an online Tesla community. I think it's generally the experience is very positive. I think people look at it like, I don't know, when you get excited about an update, maybe for iOS or Android or something that brings in new features and new capabilities. A lot of times, they're really great. I do think there is. Uh, I think Tesla tends to live fast and take chances sometimes, which might be a little terrifying when we're talking about the safety of passengers in a car. Um, uh, but um, you know, I think that it's a different experience. I think we could talk about your Tesla all day now um, because I've got a whole load of questions <laughs> about reliability, which I, I hear all different things about. But sure. we should have a separate podcast about that, mm -hmm. Jeremy. Um, yeah. so, they're, not without, they're not without their problems, that's for sure. It's amazing how they are sometimes slated for reliability, but they have such amazing customer loyalty at the same time, which is quite rare in any brand. So my last question is, if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would that be? We'll go Jeremy first on this one. Sure. Uh, this one is easy for me. I'm, I'm a huge science geek, um, and I would pick Albert Einstein. And, you know, my reasoning there is, I think, to come up with an idea like relativity is so counterintuitive to human experience and so incompatible with our everyday lives that you have to have a truly special mind to go down that rabbit hole, essentially. So I think uh, I would pay a lot of money to you know, go out to the pub and have a few beers with him <laughs> if he were still around and just try to, you know, let one tiny little sliver of that capability rub off on me. And Thomas? It would be Alan Turing, because I want to know if he's a guy or a machine. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell... I think that we could probably end up discussing so much more all day long, but unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Um, please stay tuned for part two, which will be available next week, where Thomas and Jeremy will be telling us more about how they got to where they are today. Thank you.